All right, welcome back. This is Social Studies 20, and we're looking at a cartoon today. The skills that we're about to look at should help you with the A1, which is a source interpretation. And often in the multiple choice, you'll also have sources like cartoons that you're meant to unpack and find ideological perspectives. Being that the course is Social 20, the overarching theme of the course is nationalism. So as we begin to look at a source in Social 20, we should always be looking at it to uncover some kind of ideological perspective about nationalism. Now thinking for a moment, what is an ideological perspective? An ideological perspective is someone's point of view. Someone's point of view about nationalism, put most simply, is are they celebrating it or are they challenging it? Are they suggesting that we should embrace nationalism or are they suggesting that perhaps we should protect ourselves from nationalism? Now, when you have a cartoon, like a photograph, you should consider it as a snapshot, a moment in time. And one of the ways to unpack the ideological perspective is to consider what may have happened before the photograph, or in this case, cartoon, to inspire what we see. Looking at the details on the page, we have four dominant figures. We have one that looks like they are in chains, both across the wrists and the ankles. Their knees are bloodied, they are blindfolded and gagged, and they are a beast of burden. And on their back, they have three figures that seem to be representing different socioeconomic classes or different occupations. So that's what we'd call a first glance. Always take a first glance to see what you can identify. Now, knowing that this is Social 20 and the placement of this cartoon in Social 20 should be when we study the French Revolution and more specifically the causes of the French Revolution. So always understanding the context of the source can help us unpack the perspective. Here we have a historical source, one that we've used at the time of the French Revolution. So knowing the time period and the location of the source, we can begin to infer, begin to speculate what the source is implying about nationalism. Here the source is used as a communication device. In the late 18th century, not everybody could read. So often in order to communicate one's ideological perspective, you'd have to illustrate it. Within the source, the topic that is being discussed is the old regime, the name for the socioeconomic political order of the French under the king and absolutism. So King Louis XVI was the last absolute monarch of France before the French Revolution. And this is a communication about the plight of the third estate during that feudalistic era. So there's an emotional appeal to the figure at the bottom of the cartoon. We would not wish to trade places with this figure. So we are meant to have this emotional appeal to that figure where we feel their, their plight, the burden that they're, that they're carrying, and we wish for something different for them. The cartoonist has specifically drawn it to show that that individual has been disadvantaged by the system and to show that the other three figures in, in the source are quite dependent upon them. So knowing the history behind the cartoon, we know that the figure at the bottom is meant to represent the third estate. And the third estate in the old regime represented 97.5% of the population. It uh, certainly was quite a diverse group. The third estate would have included the, the serfs, the agrarian farmers that worked the land, not those who owned the land. But also the third estate represented the emerging uh, merchant class. And it was actually the emerging merchant class that would have had this source illustrated because they're trying to communicate an urgency. They're trying to... Um, awaken their third estate brothers 
and and have this epiphany that the old regime, that feudalism is not working for them because they are the ones carrying all of the burden. And it's the others on the back representing the first estate, the clergy, and the second estate, the, the nobility and the monarchy that are having all the benefits from the socioeconomic political order that is the old regime. So when we look at the details on the page, we can begin to infer, why was this drawn? This is drawn to create a, a moment of clarity, an epiphany, an awakening, a, a new sense of, of identity among the third estate, and hopefully inspire them to call for change. This is a revolutionary cartoon, one whose message or purpose is to question the old regime. Quite literally, this cartoon came at a time when there was a slogan, which was, what is the third estate? And the answer under the old regime was, the third estate is nothing. But what should it be? It should be everything. Because the third estate represents the majority of the French people. So it is calling for a paradigm shift, a revolution, social upheaval, changing the socioeconomic order. And how does this connect to nationalism? Nationalism is meant to be the vehicle that will create the change. That this change will only be possible when those represented at the bottom of that pyramid there, those represented as the ones carrying the burden, it'll only be possible when they have this new collective identity, this awakening as a fraternal group, that we are no longer the subjects of the king. We are the French. We are a nation. And we demand uh, change. The changes that they're demanding have been inspired by the age of, of enlightenment, the uh, age of reason, the Renaissance, this new thinking, this rethinking, this idea that, that uh, individual rights and freedoms should be universal, not just exclusive to those closest to the king. So the cartoon can only make sense when you consider it as a snapshot in time. What would have inspired this cartoonist to draw this? Well, knowing that this is an, an actual historical document that we can you know, look back and study, we know that it was meant to inspire a rethinking, a, an epiphany, a paradigm shift, a questioning of the status quo, a questioning of an order that was based upon a lottery of birth, as Peter Singer would say, one where there was very little socioeconomic um, mobility because you were condemned into your um, plight of birth. So the <clears throat> source has this emotional appeal to the conditions of the third estate and, and because we the viewer would not wish to be uh, trading places with that figure, we know that it is suggesting that we need to change the relationship between the three estates. Within a cartoon, when you unpack it, you should be looking for satire. This is a satire because it's an exaggeration. It's an exaggeration. They didn't literally uh, you know, ride the backs of the third estate. It's a satire. It's using exaggeration. And therefore, this is also a metaphor. They're metaphorically riding on the back of the third estate, representing the unfair taxation system the tax burden that was um, placed upon those maybe least capable to pay taxes. The second estate, uh, the nobility, because of their connections to the king, often were tax exempt. And the first estate, the clergy, the uh, Catholic Church in, in France was the largest landowner, but they had also... Um, benefited from a tax-free status. So one of the causes of the French Revolution was a need for a revision of the taxation system. That France, during the 1780s, was bankrupt. And King Louis XVI needed to find new sources of revenue. And uh, he attempted some tax reform, but the tax reform couldn't... Um, be effective 
as long as the first and second estate uh, still maintain some kind of tax-free exemption. The source itself isn't just an expression of the economic inequality. It's also an expression of a social inequality. So knowing that, it would give you a chance in an interpretation to talk about the social inequality that existed in the old regime. Things like preferred seating at church for the nobility. Things like the status that one could wear certain clothing uh, based upon your your status within society. So um, you might be able to wear a sword. Or even the way that uh, you would be greeted, the titles that you would have. So one of the solutions uh, during the French Revolution to overcome this situation, so you know what comes after the cartoon, one of the solutions would be the idea that the commoners uh, started identifying with their short pants, the sans culotte, and that became a equalizing symbol of the new French nation. Um, also, during the, the time of the French Revolution, they adopted the title of citizen, so everyone should be equal. Even the king <coughs> was forced to accept the title citizen capo instead of king. And and once that the you know his titles of birth were taken from him, then there's a new sense of of fraternity, of equality that uh, he was forced to share with the people. In general, when you're unpacking a cartoon in an A1, do try to consider the context. When was this written or drawn? Um, might help you consider why was it drawn? Now, what conditions led someone to sit down with a pencil and pen and say, you know what, I'm going to draw this. And by drawing it, I'm going to try to expose an ideological perspective. An ideological perspective is this is the worldview I want. And by creating this, this cartoon, they're showing a worldview that is, that is dystopian, that is flawed. So then we can infer that the cartoonist wants the opposite. A worldview of instead of inequality, maybe one of more equality. Equality where all of the classes or the estates have uh, individual rights and freedoms as they will get through the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. Also with the cartoon, uh, we can often look at the different characters within it and who they represent. So for this one, you may recall that we talked about the one on the bottom being the third estate and the other three being the other two estates. You have the clergy, you have the monarchy, and the nobility. And there's other symbols there to help you, things like the cross, so you can identify which one's which. Connecting it to nationalism again, um, keeping in mind we want to make sure that before we, we finish our paragraph on interpreting the cartoon, we make it clear how does this connect to nationalism. Again, nationalism is seen as the remedy for the problem shown within the source. That once the third estate have that moment of clarity, their their epiphany, that they you know create that bond that that uh, ties them together in their commitment to overcome this, that's when they'll be able to overcome the the inequality of the old regime. And we know that that happens with the tennis court oath, and we know that it happens with the storming of the Bastille. And we know that those two things will lead to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the abolition of feudalism and eventually the uh, creation of a French Republic. And in those things, they will change the conditions that are shown in the cartoon. Another tool that we can look at when we unpack these sources is what is the significance of the source? If left unaddressed, if we ignore the problem within the source, how bad might society be? If we leave the problem, which is socioeconomic inequality, um, you know, this lottery of birth, uh, unaddressed, how bad might life get? Well, life would become very limiting. And for the French of 1788 and the winter of 1788 and 89, uh, one of the very real immediate consequences of this Inequality was a bread shortage that led to starvation and for some death. 
Another way to unpack a source is to talk about the division of society surrounding the issue and the perspective presented. So we often use words like opponents and proponents of the source. A proponent of the source is someone who would share the ideological perspective, share some of the values and the assumptions, some of the roles of citizens or the roles of government that are, are um, either celebrated or, or maybe questioned within the source. So when we look at this source here, we know that there's many philosophers that would echo this sentiment. Voltaire would celebrate the fact that it's questioning the status quo. Voltaire was a proponent of the idea that we must question those institutions within society that wield power. Nothing should be beyond dissent. Uh, we also had the ideas of John Locke, that the government must rule to promote the individual rights of the people that the government must be there to represent the will of the people. We have um, the ideas shown here of Montesquieu, that a government should not be absolute, that no one person or even institution should have all powers of government, but rather they should be separated among the three branches, the executive, legislative, and judicial branch. Within the source, we could also see elements that might pull us to Rousseau, and, and uh, you know, Rousseau's idea of, of what should be shaping government with the general will. Is this the will of the people that they wish to live as this? All sources also give us an insight into the nature of man. Under any conditions, would this be justified? Well, Hobbes might say that if man by nature is aggressive, violent, and in the absence of government authority, we would be at a state of war with each other. Hobbes might look at this and say, well, before you jump to the defense of the third estate, let us consider that the third estate have to be chained and bound. That if they're not chained and bound, then if the security of the government is taken away, then life will become less livable because there will be no security and we'll be at a state of war with each other. And there will be others who would agree with, with Hobbes. You know, during the time of the French Revolution, uh, Edmund Burke might say that the radical nature of the French Revolution creates, uh, you know, chaos and anarchy in the streets. And in that lack of security, tens of thousands will be killed. And that isn't a better existence than what had existed before the French Revolution. So there's many, many sides to this. When we look at fascism later in the year, we'll look at uh, people like Schopenhauer and Gentile and Sorel and how they would argue that life only has purpose when we submit to the state. Well, this surely, surely doesn't show an individual enjoying life's purpose by submitting to the will of others. So this would challenge some of those fascist ideas. So moving ahead, it's going to be important for you to have success in Social 20 to have a cast of characters. So that when you have a source such as this, you might be able to reflect on the ideological perspective that is seen within it and how it might how it might lend itself to conversation among our philosophers. But let's not stray away from the key part of the assignment. The key part of this assignment remains, how does it relate to nationalism? If you do everything but that, if you talk about it being a satire, if you talk about its context, if you talk about, you know, any personifications and metaphors and, and you... You talk all about the division of society and significance, but you ignore the nationalism side. You've not done the assignment. The assignment is how does it connect to nationalism? So in summary, this connection to nationalism is during the old regime, um, they weren't meant to be a nation of France. They were a kingdom. So it's the absence of nationalism that allowed for this oppression. That nationalism was meant to be the cure is meant to be a, a tool that the masses could use to overcome this, this oppression. And as we see with the French Revolution, spoiler alert, if you haven't finished um, looking at it, they will be able to overcome the oppression, but there will be new oppressors.